Hello, and welcome to this online event presented by the British Library. My name is Julian Harrison, and I am the lead curator of Medieval Historical Manuscripts. We hope that you're all safe and well out there, whether you're watching this event live or you're following us on our catch-up service. We're absolutely delighted today to be joined by Edward Brooke Hitchin, who is talking about his new book, The Madman's Library, in conversation with John Lloyd. But before they have their talk, I just want to run through a few points of housekeeping. First of all, Edward and John will attempt to answer any of your questions at the end of this presentation. If you wish to ask a question, please use the comments box at the bottom of this screen. Secondly, would really welcome any of your feedback. So please use the menu at the top of the screen. And also the British Library is a registered charity. So would very much welcome your donations. And also if you'd like to buy copies of Edward's book, The Madman's Library, please follow the link at the top of the screen. If you'd like to continue this conversation using social media, please look at the links at the bottom of the presentation. And also there you'll be able to find more information about this event with short biographies of John and Edward. But first, I'd like to introduce to you John Lloyd. He is a television and radio comedy presenter and producer. He's best known for QI, Black Adder, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Spitting Image, and Not the Nine O'Clock News. And he is currently the presenter of BBC Radio 4's The Museum of Curiosity. So please welcome John Lloyd. Very nice to be here. It looks like I'm actually in the British Library, doesn't it? But I'm not. This is my office. Um, now, this really is Edward Brooke Hitchens' book, The Madman's Library, really is the most fantastic book. Um, and I'm not the only one who thinks so. It was made uh, Sunday Times Literary Book of the Year 2019. And here's some quotes. Anybody who loves the printed word will be bowled over by this amusing, erudite, beautiful book about books. It is in every way a triumph, one of the loveliest books to have been published for many, many years. And that's Alexander McCall Smith, no less. So it is a beautiful book, as he says. Um, it's fascinating, it's hilarious, it's poignant, weird by turns, and visually delicious enough to eat the spoon. Um, it's full of, as a QI person, um, it's full of the most delicious bits of uh, information, uh, factoids, uh, even the footnotes are interesting, which I think is almost unique in books. Um, here's one. The Italian poet Gabriele D'Annunzio, 1868 to 1938, had his books printed on rubber so he could read them in the enormous sunken bath he shared with his goldfish. So <laughs> that's the kind of mad eccentricity. So um, let's say hello to Edward. Edward, hello. There he is, hey, John. He's the distinguished author. Um, uh, as I say, it's it's so so good. This I can't. I've been reading it all day, Ed. I've been right through it twice. Here's another <laughs> one. The Cornish physician Richard Lower, sixteen thirty one to ninety one, wanted to see if dogs could be fed by injecting soup into their veins. You probably remember him. Yes. So, um, what I was going to say, it's a feast for the eyes as well as the mind. And before I come to sort of grill you. I just want to show everybody at home some of the amazing images from this book. Let's have a little quick slideshow just to show how delicious this look at. There we go. All these extraordinary illustrations, photographic yeah. and, uh, uh, and, and drawn from all different cultures and all different uh, uh, styles and times. So tell me a little bit about your background. What was your childhood like? <laughs> well, I, this is the product of um, growing up as the uh, son of a, of a rare book dealer. Um, <laughs> my dad worked from home, so I grew up in a rare book shop. And while he specialised in um, British exploration and travel, um, it's particularly with Captain Cook, uh, like any dealer, uh, he would encounter 
uh, unique things, bizarre things. And of course, when you're when you're younger and you don't have a, a PhD in the history of a certain subject, that's what catches your eye. A bit like you know what what um, QI did, um, does as sort of opening up history with the most tantalizingly curious aspects of it. Um, and so that's what I always wanted to do was to find a way to crack open the uh, well, probably not to the viewers. Uh, our viewers today, but to most people, the, the world of antiquarian books is viewed as quite a sort of musty, uh, grey, dull, dark thing, a bit like a geode. But, you know, if you crack it open in the right way, there's these amazing, uh, glittering, weird things inside. Um, and so it, it seemed like the best way to do that was focus on the books themselves, because I love books about books, but I'm I don't, I'm not as interested in reading about the classics and the great authors um, as I am curious about books I've never heard of before. Um, and so it became, you know, imagining a library of these things. You know, if Isaac Disraeli um, had a library uh, today with uh, infinite budget and uh, complete lack of, you know, basic, basic practical sense, what kind of books would be on that sort of um, shelf of the ultimate library of curiosity? So that was the general guiding theme um, and so yeah hopefully and, and to provide enough images so that you believe that these things really do and did exist that was pretty crucial too yeah it, one of the things that's really distinguished about the book as I was saying to you the other day that um, it's you're using your left brain and your right brain alternately because look at a picture you've got to have one kind of way of thinking sort of intuitive and spatial mm. and uh, words are the left brain and it's actually an extraordinarily sort of rich experience and the other thing i can't you told me it's only taken you a year to write which i find completely astonishing well it's a year to write but 10 years to do the research for oh. but luckily you can you can work on multiple books simultaneously but you just need that um that green green light from the publisher to say that this year you get to do this one um and so yeah having having done books about strange and beautiful maps um, this was the dream project. This is what I always, um, you know, secretly wanted to, to do. And, you know, you were talking about left brain and right brain. Well, for anyone who's ever really immersed themselves um, browsing library catalogues, but auction catalogues as well, um, that's the experience you have. But you're sort of dazzled by both the images and uh, the sheer wealth of material. So trying to trying to make something like that for the general reader, someone who might otherwise walk past um, the book about book section. Um, that was that was the goal. Yeah, because we should declare an interest because of course you, uh, in your spare time, I can't believe you have any spare time, but you work for QI as a, a researcher yeah. and script writer because yeah. we came across you because one of our elves, as they're called, Andrew Hunter Murray, was given your first book, I think, Fox Tossing, Octopus Wrestling yeah. and Other Forgotten <laughs> Sports for Christmas. And he just thought it was amazing and then met you at a party and he that's I think how you came to into our purview and yeah. I rather imagine it must be quite quite interesting to be amongst people who are as crazy about information as you are that must be quite yes ab absolutely and people who have read the same um, strange books I mean the QI library itself rivals the BL in terms of the scope of things that are of subject the range of subjects that are on the shelves because the uh, anything from the history of feces to, uh, you know, the sort of uh, social hierarchy of ants or something like that. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's for anyone who's, who watches and loves the program, which I'm sure a lot of people watching this do as well. Um, it's that celebration of, um, of the obscure and the strange and, and things that seem too strange to be true. That's, that's where all the pleasure comes from. Um, waiting to see if someone's pulling your leg, but actually know these things. Um, it's, it's, fact is often stranger than anyone could possibly imagine. Well I think our backgrounds here show that we we are of like mind and of course many of the other elves ha are similarly you know crazy um, about <laughs> yeah. and their contents and yeah. yes the strangeness I remember by for all the books that one's read you know sex and slavery in medieval Scandinavia a history of yep. Hull you know I once read an entire <laughs> Dutch dictionary just for the pleasure of it that kind of thing so so we, we are kin. But so, uh, one thing that fascinated me, because it's got such range, the book, geographical and historical, did you travel a lot in that year particularly? 
In those 10 years, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, around to various cities in Europe, when I um, went to Poland for a, a book talk, um, the first thing I did was go to not just um, the public libraries, but also to um, rare book dealers um, and take take with me a sort of list of themes of things I wanted to sort of grow. And yeah, one of them was, tell me the strangest book you've ever come across. <laughs> Um, in the hope that I could completely crowdsource all the material and maybe that would take care of everything. Um, but it's a lot of fun because dealers, like librarians, um, de but dealers are much more mercenary. You know, they have that magpie eye um, and they know exactly how to zero in on a great story to sell you a book. Because it's a very intimidating thing walking into an antiquarian bookshop um, for anyone who hasn't hasn't dared to do it it seems quite sort of off-putting but um they are they are a wonderful resource of 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 um alternative um back channels of, of history and um to find things you never knew existed um so they were absolutely uh the number one resource to consult uh, around europe and and in america there's the grolier club in new york who are very um helpful with tips and tricks um and it was it, it, it was quite a difficult thing because you're saying, tell me something that no one knows about. You're asking an expert that. Um, so you really need to find something surprising. If you're going to, if you're going to do a book and you're going to arrogantly claim, here are things that you don't know about, you've really got to back that up. You know? Well, bookshops are uh, a salvation for people like you and me because, because of the algorithmic nature of the modern internet, you know, when we started QI 20 odd years ago, you know, it was a treasure trove of stuff because of all these different yeah. people posting about absolutely everything and it wasn't moderated. So you could go up rabbit holes, but now they only tell you what they think you want to hear. Um, yes. Whereas in a bookshop, go to a secondhand bookshop and you will get surprises because you can you can browse in a non-linear way, I guess. Absolutely. And go, go to, I'd, I recommend to everyone, I mean, now is a bit of a tricky time, obviously, but um, if you love immersing yourself in, in the British Library, talking to the librarians about their particular interest, I would really recommend going to um, an antiquarian book fair as well, um, especially the, the, the London book fair, um, because there are dealers from all over Europe who are bringing their shiniest things. And so much of it from all the continental dealers are works that um, especially if they're illustrated, it's, it certainly helps get an idea of what's going on. But there are so many things that that you will never have come across, and they are usually snapped up by as many librarians searching for new acquisitions as they are by collectors and other dealers. And you meet some amazing people. I mean, when I was um, talking to dealers for this book, um, one of them said, "Oh, you should talk to this uh, customer I just spoke to, who only ever buys uh, copy number ninety-seven of every limited edition book." Um, and he refuses to tell anyone why it's 97. So there's all kinds of um, uh, mysterious characters in there as well. Yeah, so um, did you spend a lot of time in the over the last 10 years in the British Library itself? Uh, absolutely. Um, and I really, you know, I really, really miss it, uh, as I'm sure a lot of people do. Um, and purely from a selfish point of view, it's been a nightmare in a sense. Um, I'm very lucky to do this. But it has been extremely tricky um, doing the research and expensive <laughs> doing yeah. the research um, of finding all the books. And I know that I've probably missed so many great resources that the BL have to offer. But but luckily also, um, um, we saw Julian Harrison introducing us at the beginning. Um, you know, follow Julian on Twitter. He's amazing at sort of revealing um, uh, sort of discoveries he's made in, in their archives and manuscripts you've never heard of. Um, and also the BL publish a huge amount of uh, um, sort of generous um, articles um, uh, with their experts revealing their um, these these secret stories. So that that's been a lot of consolation. It's been um, it's been seeing all the amazing uh, digitization efforts by the library as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really that really does open up the library. I'm not sure we people who have grown up with the idea of a digitization project realize just, just how lucky we are to have that because it really wasn't that long ago that the great treasures of libraries were completely locked away yeah. uh, and you know untouchable to anyone who didn't have a PhD and with special permission from the king. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, I feel like this is a, a, a really, despite the challenging circumstances, this is a really amazing time to be able to 
write books because of what well, technology and the generosity of librarians offers. Very, very good, very, very, very good point. So what you've done is um, you've selected a bunch of images from the book as a kind of, to suggest a, a, a spine to the, the chat, as it were. Um, yes. Uh, and uh, just to, to because there's, as I say, so much information, you can't possibly keep it all in your head and we can't, we can't cover everything because it's so, so diverse. But yeah. what, what should we kick off with? I think it should be as if we are wandering through a real library. Right. And we should randomly reach out and grab the volumes that um, hopefully best represent um, the intention to sort of have fun and be surprised. So um, I think perhaps the, the, the subject that I always get asked a lot about, particularly, that I think partly because it's the most gruesome, but equally the most horribly fascinating area of the history of book production is the thankfully lost art of anthropodermic bibliopagy. So if we have image one, I think it is. Well, you'll have to um, explain that to most people, I think. What yes. Um, so if you, you, this is a very admirable binding, isn't it? Lovely gilt, rich, um, blood like crimson, but this is actually a book bound in human skin. That's what anthropodermic bibliopagy means. Um, it's a mid 17th century volume. It's, this one is actually in the co um, collection of the Wellcome Library in London. Um, and it's a work on, uh, it's a French work on um, pregnancy, childbirth, virginity. It's called De Integritatis. Um, and I thought it best represents this theme because it's so surprisingly beautiful and it, and it, it mm. sort of belies this horrible, horrible nature. But, but as with every, everything in history, just, just like on QI, you have to interrogate everything without just reflexively recoiling and disgust. Um, you have to think, okay, why? Why did people bind books? in human skin, it's unthinkable to our modern sensibilities. But the fact is that it was uh, an optional extra that while I'm sure it wasn't beloved and um, was offered by many binders and it had a very powerful um, um, symbology to it because you find three main genres of literature bound in human skin and most of these books in collections around the world those um, institutions that admit they have them, um, you, you usually date from between 1600 to 1800. So this is smack in there. Um, and the idea was very simple. So it's medical works of maybe strange cases, um, quite often beautiful women, because it's more tragically romantic as well. But it encapsulates um, this, this period, this emerging understanding of science. Um, and what you notice is there's a crossover from uh, medical work such as this to criminal cases and there are quite a good amount of these books are actually the records or um, the trial notes of highwaymen of um, well for example in the Bristol record office they have a human skin binding of a book um, about the exploits of a man called John Horwood who was very jealous and he saw a woman who had spurned him walking along a stream with her new boyfriend and he threw a pebble at her it struck her in the head and she fell into the stream and went into a coma um, and she died and he was hanged and they printed or well, they bound the record of his awful crime in his own skin and it acts as a warning it's it's like a way of um of punishing someone metaphorically because what what better way of um of emphasizing and and punishing this outlaw um this uh that's abhorrent to society than representing them in the very symbol of civilization the book um, so it's a very fitting punishment. And I would imagine it's actually quite a good deterrent as well. I mean, it's quite a frightening thought that, that could end up happening to you. Um, and then as we move into the uh, 19th century, when it's still practiced, human skin binding, um, you find it used as more as a romantic metaphor to um, encapsulate literature in the same way that skin um, encapsulates our, our souls. And so the very fam most famous an um, example of that is from 1877 with the French astronomer writer um, Camille Flammarion, who was at a party and he, he didn't think much of it. He complimented a passing countess on the charm of her skin. It turned out she was dying of a terminal illness. And the next thing he knows, a few weeks later, there's a knock at his door. A famous uh, Parisian surgeon called Monsieur Sue has a bundle under his arm saying he's just flayed the marvelously attractive countess whose last all, um, request was that her skin be given to Flammarion for him to bind a copy of his latest work. Now, this all sounds like total hot air, but, but for example, with Flammarion, he, um, he confirmed it to newspapers 
And so there is a copy of his, um, his novel, Les Terres du Ciel, um, bound in the skin of, of a beautiful countess. So it's, it, it's, it's the most um, shocking but uh, absorbing area of book history to sort of present a potted history of and not get too, not, get, not hang around long enough for a mess to get on your shoes, you know? The, uh, yeah, there's a great story about that, um, talking of uh, criminals and bindings, of the, the mm. uh, Dutch naturalist Hermann Boerhaver, who had a pair of ladies' shoes made from the skin of an executed criminal whose nipples were used to decorate the front of the instep. Yes. I thought that was Isn't a that horrible? ordinary touch. Yes, and it's, it, not, um, it's not just human skin, too, is it? Because you write in the book, if a creature has run, hopped, slithered, or swum on this planet, at some point its skin has been used to bind a book. So yes, you track, yes. track down all sorts of oddities. Das Kapital in Boa Constrictor Hyde? Mm -hmm. Mein Kampf in Skunk. Um, <laughs> this is, these, are, these are examples of uh, what's called sympathetic binding, which actually applies to a lot of human skin um, practice as well. But it was a way of Riley um, matching the material, the outer material to the um, thematic material of the book. So it's a lot of fun going through auction records, finding these strange examples. And I think I've got an image in there of um, a copy of Paradise Lost bound in snakeskin as well. Which is lovely. And, and, and Moby Dick in whale skin. That's yeah, yes. Yes. And then Victorian big game hunters um, loved to self-publish their, you know, journals of their adventures and bind them in some, some poor exotic animal. Lion or something. Exactly, yeah. Was, hide. Another fascinating thing, it's not just the outsides of the book in this chapter um, about this kind of thing, is Saddam Hussein and the Quran. That was an extraordinary story. Yes, uh, that was looking at if you've got books made of flesh, uh, how about books written in blood? Um, and I know this sounds like I've, I've been obsessing over the goriest parts. I promise it's much more buried than that. Um, but blood writing has a surprisingly a long history going back to uh, as a sort of Buddhist ascetic practice, a way of um, devotional sacrifice, cutting your fingers, even breaking your bones to literally pour yourself into your work and earn you merit and karma. Um, but we can skip around the centuries and around the world. So if you imagine a, a, a Buddhist blood written work on the shelf, what could go next to it? Well, um, I talked to um, a lovely book dealer called Ali Rao at um, Mags Brothers in London, who are big book dealers. And she said, oh, yes, now hang on, book, books written in blood, that reminds me. And they had just sold um, a copy of uh, the account of a shipwreck from, I think, 1840 called Fate of the Blenden Hall, um, which had been written by the uh, captain uh, and all but two of the, uh, the ship's uh, crew and passengers had survived. The quartermaster, the captain writes, pushed past his own wife and child to jump onto the life raft. Um, but they made it to the uh, ironically named inaccessible island. But he had, he had to use what washed up ashore to keep his journal. And he had a writing desk that turned up. He had stacks of the Times newspapers and he had pens, but he had no ink. And so the clue is given in the subtitle of the book, which is written entirely in the blood of the penguin. <laughs> so unfortunately, that's that's how he sourced his material. Um, but you can skip forward again to 1977, I think, and the American rock band Kiss um, were asked to star in a Marvel comic book. And as a gimmick, they were flown to the printing factory and had blood withdrawn from their arms, which was mixed with the chemicals. Uh, and so this comic book um, declares on the front, printed in the blood of Kiss. But yes, like you mentioned, the ultimate story or the ultimate example of this um, area is an amazing story that not very many people have come across, um, presumably because it was just so horrible and covered up. But Saddam Hussein, who was not you know, noted for rational um, behavior generally, uh, when he was uh, aiming to celebrate his 60th birthday in 1999, he commissioned a master calligrapher of Baghdad to create an 800 page Quran um, written in Saddam Hussein's blood. So over a period of two years, he had something like over 50 pints of blood withdrawn from his arm and mixed in with the chemicals. Um, but of course, the problem with that uh, in Islam is, of course, it's haram, it's forbidden to create this kind of monstrosity, but it's also forbidden to destroy a Quran. So it presents its, uh, a dilemma to its archivists, and supposedly it sits somewhere underneath Baghdad in an archive that can only be opened by three separate keys simultaneously. 
um, because no one knows what to do with it. But I include a, a photo of it on display to prove that this is not just uh, not just a rumor. I thought it was the fascinating thing was an, an element of poignancy in that Saddam said that he had led a very dangerous life and should have lost a lot more blood than he did. And this was his way of saying thank you to God, which is struck yes, me as a strangely kind of human thing that even the worst people got aside to them, which is, you know, a little yeah. Uh, Bit kind of, well, well, that's great. So I think we've covered the most gruesome bits um, uh, first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's move on to another picture. Okay. Well, so if if we have a look at um, uh, the second picture too, this is um, hopefully something that people will never have seen before, and it do it doesn't look that remarkable, does it? But this is um, this was uh, a result of Captain Cook's famous voyages um, uh, on these exp expeditions in the South Pacific. Um, the crew collected samples each each uh there are multiple different samples in this image that we're looking at of tapper cloth um this um cloth made from the barks of trees that the local people would make for and use for all kinds of purposes and the british crew would sort of collect samples and they brought them home and an enterprising book dealer decided to sell them um in uh custom made books he'd, he'd make one up for on demand for whoever walked into his uh, walked in his door. So it, it's known, it's nicknamed as um, Captain Cloth, uh, sorry, Captain Cook's uh, Atlas of Cloth because it is it, it is an extraordinary um, artifact from the history of exploration because you can literally feel, um, <laughs> taste, smell um, cultures, many of which no longer exist, but you can travel around the world um, through um, using much of your senses without ever moving um so, so it's a fascinating relic of um exploration and, and maybe it should be paired with the aurora australis which was produced on shackleton's expedition from 1907 to 09 mm. which was uh, which is much uh, very famous and and was the first book written produced printed and bound in the antarctic um and the copies are unique because they didn't have leather with them they, for the bindings, they use the boards of their tea cases. Um, so each one is different. Each one is stamped mm. with different letterings on the inside. So again, a very exciting book. So this is in a, a chapter called Curious Collections, which is um, full of yes. full of good treats. Um, yes, uh, well, which is a lot of fun, but I have to admit, I, I, I don't know which, um, which sort of area it, of, of these sort of literary histories you prefer, but for me, the the um what the about the running really... fish because right okay so okay yes let's link to that so if we have a look at image eight for example thank you um this uh is a typically sort of hallucinogenic uh illustration from uh, a book by a an amsterdam publisher called louis renard and in 1719 europeans knew very little about indonesian wildlife louis renard uh knew even less, but that didn't stop him from producing this magnificent uh, two volume history of the fish of the Indonesian waters. Um, but as he admits in the introduction to the second volume, the se second volume, it's things start to get a little um, short of accuracy or maybe generous with the truth. Um, and he also had these extraordinary colorings done of the illustrations, presumably as a, you know, very understandable to, to sell the books. Um, but if you look at the bottom right image, you can see that little blue fish actually has um, four legs um, and it's known as the uh, le poisson courant or the running fish and the little inscription above it um, tells um, provides the details that um, uh, this this fish has been known to um, leave the uh, uh, sea follow people up the shore follow them home and in fact a, a friend of the author supposedly has a keeps one in his house like a dog and it just follows him around and he pets it um, so he, he also covers different crabs that like living in mountains, crabs that climb trees. And there's even an illustration of a mermaid, which supposedly cried like a mouse. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, another thing is just, I, I wonder if we should leave the picture up as long as that. I don't know, we'll, 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 we'll see, they'll work it out. Okay. Rather than our faces, yeah, that's what people want to see. Um, um, well, if we're talking about amazing illustrations, maybe we should have a look at the um, dive into the supernatural. Um, because if, if we could possibly have image three, I know we're jumping around here. I'm sorry, John, if I've thrown you off a track. 
Um, I just thought it was quite, in terms of color, I thought it might be quite a good link. Is that called? Sorry, has that caused chaos? Did you have another idea? No, no, not at all. You, okay, you... cool. All right, so I'll. I think what this best illustrates is we're now we're looking at a at a work that is technically classed as a grimoire or a spell book, um, but because this is dated to about 1775, this is produced at a time when the hysteria over witchcraft and magic has died down. Um, this is known informally as the Compendium of Demonology and Magic, and it's full of these wonderful watercolor gouache um, illustrations, um, and as well as the devil that you can see here chewing in his trademark position, chewing on limbs, probably of the three traitors, as, as Dante describes. Um, you also have these biz uh, alternative bizarre illustrations of um, how to go treasure hunting with um, by summoning demons, which actually serves as a warning because in this particular illustration, um, the devil with an enormous, uh, how do I put this, uh, devil tackle or uh, demonic genitals, which crop up fairly regularly in grimoires, I guess to highlight this sort of uh, outrageous, uh, <laughs> illegal nature of the books themselves. Um, but this compendium of demonology and magic serves both as uh, a sort of tempting, um, uh, sort of journey of naughtiness into things that were once forbidden while also serving um, as clear warnings to not ever um, get involved with this kind of magic because obviously with with a lot of grimoires the dates that are given on their production um, are complete lies a lot of them is uh, sort of image engineering the authors are usually either anonymous or they're credited to king solomon or, or other character or moses you know people from people of uh, spiritual wisdom um and i recommend to anyone interested in grimoires there's a brilliant book by owen davis um, which does a brilliant overview of the history of all of them um so um perhaps this could be a good way into that yeah i was um wondering about I've just wanted to go, drop back a picture, uh, not yeah, yeah. to see the picture, but the, the thing that was particularly close to my heart was um, Harvey Einbinder's The Myth of the Britannica. <laughs> yeah. About that. yeah, so uh, yes, looking at maybe interesting stories behind the big collections that we all know and love. Um, so for example, yes, uh, the Harvey Einbinder was this uh, very furious American physicist who could, who fi had finally had enough of just how many mistakes there were in his edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And so he compiled, actually, I think I have a copy. He compiled an entire book listing every mistake that was in there. Let me just find the camera. There we go. Ivy and Binder. This is from, this is in the 1950s, I think. Um, and he had no interest in forcing them to correct themselves. He just wanted to embarrass them um, and it's, it's this wonderful story that doesn't often get associated with the Encyclopedia Britannica just as um, for any any who don't know the surprisingly murderous origin stories of the Oxford English Dictionary it's an extraordinary story of when in 1879 James Murray was you know com um, commissioned to embark on this mammoth project no one had attempted this since Dr Johnson and he realized, uh, this is too much for me to handle. I'm going to need to crowdsource. So he sent out appeals through bookshops and libraries and the public submitted definitions and example uses of words. But the most prolific contributor by far was um, a doctor, uh, Dr. William uh, Chester Minor. And over years, Minor produced uh, thousands and thousands of really useful definitions and, and Murray credited him with um, um, uh, contributing to a significant chunk of the work. And finally, uh, Murray said, you know, my friend, we must meet. They struck up a correspondence. Uh, and um, Minor had always forbidden it. He said, no, no we, can we can't meet. And finally he relented and he said, okay, fine, take a train to Crowthorne in Berkshire. There'll be a carriage waiting for you and it'll take you to me. And he's led up to this um, beautiful, enormous building shown into the, um, the the main study and there's a man standing there and Murray says my friend it's so good to meet you and the man says right no 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 I'm not I'm not minor I'm 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 his uh, I'm his uh, I'm his doctor he's he's a he's a patient here at um, at the Broadmoor um, uh, insane asylum for yeah. criminally insane 
Um, and he was a Civil War surgeon who had just, um, he saw Irishmen everywhere. And unfortunately he mistake, he thought one was, had stolen something from his bed, chased this phantom out into the street and shot an innocent passerby. And ever since then he's been uh, committed. But he had a lot of time on his hands and a lot of books, and he was a very smart man. So that's who we have to credit for a lot of our Oxford English Dictionary. Well, just going back to the Britannica, QI actually owns three entire sets of the Britannica, the 1911 edition, the 33, and the 98. Right. And it's fascinating right. how, a, a bit like your book, you know, if you read the 1911 edition, it's like a work of poetry. It's magical. Yeah. The yeah. sense of wonder and surprise is so delicious. Yeah. And the 33, again, is all, you know, amazing stuff about engineering and, and, and uh, Indian philosophy and so on. And by the time it's got to 1998, the sort of right mm. towards the end of the print edition when they stopped doing it, it's basically uh, the economies of towns in the Midwest of America. It's very strange. And it had big yeah. influence on QI. It's almost, almost the reason why... QI started because when my son was born, I was determined to be the best dad in the world. And I bought my first print set of the encyclopedia in 1998. Oh, wow. It wasn't, no, it wasn't, it was in the 90s. And um, determined to read the whole thing from cover to cover. So I'd know to, yeah. to answer any of Harry's questions. Apart from <laughs> the park, I was so annoyed at how boring it was. <laughs> I went to see a friend of mine and said, somebody should take only the interesting bits of the Encyclopedia Britannica and make it a short, crunchy book, which is sort of slightly yeah. what, what Harvey Einbinder did. Okay, if next he, slide, he, please, Edward, let's go yeah. on. All right, um, what do you feel like, John? How about, how about uh, uh, some literary hoaxes? Because um, those are my yeah. favorite, those are my favorite stories. Um, so if we could have maybe image four, please, just have a look at this, it's just amazing. So. Uh, a change from books. So this is a statue of the snake god Glycon. Now, <laughs> this, is, this is bizarre. So this, this dates back to a gentleman from the second century AD, uh, a Greek named Alexander of Abinatakos, who wanted to make something of himself. So he went to the local temple of the local god, I think it was Asclepius. Uh, he buried some fake tablets that he had created uh, and he took with him a tame snake that he left on the ground um, and waited for the tablets to be discovered by someone. They were just poking up. And when they were, uh, he arrived in Prophet's Road, declared himself the representative um, Asclepius, this god, um, and translating the text um, said, uh, Asclepius now wishes to be known as Glycon, the snake deity Glycon. I am his earthly representative. Uh, fall in line, uh, join my join, join this new religion. But what's so extraordinary is the way that he he held sway over his followers, because according to Lucian, who is our one source for this story, so you know we're hoping it's all true. Um, Alexander, <laughs> Alexander, um, the source of his power was uh, a, a hand puppet. He created a, a snake puppet. Um, made of uh, linen that he held on his hand. Lucian says it used horse hairs to operate and a little uh, forked tongue would sort of um, pop back out, uh, back and forth. And he would use it to make proclamations channeling uh, glycon. And this, uh, it sounds like absolute nonsense, um, but from archeological evidence of the image that we've just saw, um, that is a statue that was dug up in the 90s um, under the uh, train station in Romania. Um, and it suggests that uh, Alexander's glycon cult lasted for 100 years after his death. Um, but he would, he would use the puppet to answer his followers' questions. He'd secretly read their questions so he knew what answers to give. I mean, he was a real, he was a real uh, chancer. He, he's an amazing character. Um, but I thought he was a kind of spiritual descendant of a character. I know you're familiar with John of George Salmanazar, yeah, in the eight, early 18th century. Who, uh, it, that's just my favourite kind of character in 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 cartography or in in historical geography. They're known as travel liars, um, people who invent an entire nation or country or city for their own personal gain. And George Salmanazar, for people who haven't heard of him, um, was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed man who spoke with a thick French accent who turned up in London in the sort of very early 1700s, announced himself as the first person 
from Taiwan to have ever stepped foot on the European continent. And he was the toast of high society. He was invited to dinner parties. He became good friends with Dr. Johnson because he told these outrageous stories of um, the, um, the, the life of what things were like in Taiwan, of how the priests would sacrifice annually 20,000 boys and eat their hearts raw. And he produced a book in 1704 called A Historical Description of Formosa. Um, and the second edition was illustrated and that one really sold well because it has uh, images of, um, of uh, sort of devil towers and the alphabet. And it was all completely made up and we never, we never discovered his true name, but um, he was he was immensely well liked and he was clearly immensely clever. He was grilled at the Royal Society by Edmund Hawley, who was trying to catch him out, um, and asked him about Formosan chimneys. And Hawley said, um, "Can you see the sun reach the bottom of the chimney?" And Samanasar says, "No, we can't." And Hawley says, "Ah, oh, well, you see, you're lying because uh, Taiwan is in the tropics." and the sun would be shining directly down. And quick as a flash, Sam Anazar said, absolutely, but you see, Formosan chimneys are corkscrew shaped. The sun never makes it down. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, he does sound an amazing person, because as you say, Dr. Johnson was a big fan. Um, big fan, yeah. Uh, and he was and he, supposedly he, really, really witty. And another, on, on yeah. the travel lines, there's a great um, piece about the cruise of the Kawa, wanderings in the South Seas, 1921, <laughs> yes. with, uh, Captain um, Walter E. Traprock, who was really Walter cool. E. Traprock, and it was a completely fictitious book, and it's celebrated with people who are interested in um, in uh, exploration literature as being the the greatest parody of travel literature. It was meant to sort of puncture the the pompous, a bit like how Instagram now, well, used to be, uh, uh, people showing off all their luxurious holidays. It was lampooning. Um, the sort of the wealthy who would write up their travel accounts of, of not very difficult journeys. Um, but it's fully illustrated with photos. It's, I think it dates from about 1920, 21, 21 maybe? Yeah. 21, yeah. Um, and so it's photos taken of these, um, these intrepid voyages going to a, an exotic island. But the photos are very clearly taken in a cheap photo studio. And for example, they mentioned the, the eggs the, of the exotic fatwa bird. And if you actually look closely, it's it's a pair of dice stuck in a bird. Yeah, he, he says they're square eggs. They lay square, square eggs. eggs. It's obviously a set of <laughs> yeah, dice. Yeah, yeah. you know, there's so many good, funny things in it because yeah. um, the author, Trap Rock, uh, his huge pseudonym, is um, described as having previously written two books, <laughs> Curry Dishes for Moderate Incomes and A Round yeah. Rusher on Roller Skates. On roller skates. But yeah. people, people take it literally, don't they? Yeah. Uh, well, he was invited. Walter Walter Traprock, who didn't exist, was invited to lecture at I think at the uh, was it National Geographic or the Royal Geographical Society, an institution yeah, that really National should Geographic. know better. National Geographic. Mm -hmm. um, so I so I love those kinds of hoaxes, and they're very fun to collect because they're not viewed traditionally as having a lot of um, academic significance. They're not the great works of the 20th century or or, be, or before. So you can pick them up quite cheaply. They're a fun thing to have on your shelf because as you're reading them, you're winking back at the author, you're in on the joke with them. It's a very fun feeling. Absolutely. So, um, right, we've yeah. only got, it's amazing how the time flies. We've only got just yeah. a quarter of an hour left. So uh, pick another. another um, should we go to Japan? Because I yeah, really so love Let's do that, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so if we're talking about hoax literature, this is a bizarre story based again on in 1933, um, a Shinto priest in um, Japan, in northern Japan, discovered what was what purports to be the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. Um, sadly, the document disappeared just before World War II, um, so it's impossible to verify. But what happened is that in this document, it mentioned that Jesus had. I think there's 12 years in the, in the new, of his life in the New Testament, of his young life, that are unaccounted for. And this document claimed that in that time, Jesus had basically taken a gap year to uh, Japan, had studied with master linguists, had learned the language, and ha had a great time, and then had uh, returned home. But this document goes on to say, um, uh, at the time of the crucifixion, Jesus actually had managed to sneak away. His brother, his previously unreported brother, um, Isikuru or something like that, had, had taken his place on the cross. And Jesus fled with, um, I think his brother's ear as a memento and a lock of hair. 
um, and had fled all the way to Japan, had made it to um, a village called Shingu, which is uh, about seven hours north of Tokyo by train, where he had um, become a farmer. He lived to a grand old age of 106, had children, grandchildren, is described as being bald and quite goblin-like with a big hooked nose. Um, and the what what's the, the best part of this story is that re there remains to this day, Shingo is a thriving village. Um, the people of the village believe themselves to be descendants of Christ. They're Buddhist, so it's not a big deal. They don't care. They don't um, celebrate Christmas or anything. Uh, they just go about their business. But every year, thousands of um, pilgrims make their way from Tokyo, take that seven hour train ride north to visit the village because there, surrounded by a white picket fence, and I have an image of it in the book, is the grave of Jesus Christ um, with a nice introductory sign telling the story. That's the, um, that's and it's, the shot, isn't it, uh, John? If you put up the shot, oh, that's, brilliant. that's Jesus's yeah. grave. There we are in Shingo. There we go. There's yeah. Jesus's grave in Shingo. Um, and you see how well maintained it is. That's the local yogurt factory who keep it up. Um, there's also a, there's a gift shop where you can buy Jesus Japanese Jesus mugs and coasters apparently. So I would love to go there one day when things are returned to normal. It'd be wonderful. This is uh, um, uh, in a chapter called Religious Oddities, and I mentioned at the top <laughs> that the, even the footnotes in your book are, are fascinating, and there are a couple here which are religiously odd about a court case in the States in 1971 when a prison inmate sued the devil for depriving him of his constitutional rights. And the case was dismissed on the ground that as a foreign prince, Satan could claim sovereign immunity. <laughs> yeah. And then there's they the other one. The, the, year, the one about the Arizona lawyer who brought a negligence right. case against God for $100,000 after his secretary's house was damaged by lightning. He won the case by default when the defendant failed to appear in court. <laughs> yeah. I think that's amazing. Anyway, I think so I might have... That, that's yeah. what I, I love the uh, I love Jesus. He was a garlic farmer, apparently, you say. Garlic farmer. That's where the money is. Yeah. It's the small details that make the book so, so absolutely delicious. Let's <laughs> move on to the books of spectacular size, Edward, as we do. Oh, yeah. Time. Oh, actually, I wonder if I can show this. This is going to be impossible to show on camera for obvious reasons, but I'm still going to try it anyway. So the idea was how small have books gone and how large can they go? Um, and so if you see that this is actually, this was based on discovering, I don't think it's even going to show up. Can you see that tiny speck in the middle yeah. of the white there? So that is the smallest bound book that has ever been, uh, ever, anyone's ever managed to produce. It's 26 pages long. It was produced in Leipzig in um, 2002 um, as a celebration of the, of, of, of um, the Gutenberg press um, of the anniversary. Um, and it's actually representative of a really long history of bookbinders um, for very practical reasons, showing off their skill by trying to produce the smallest works possible, inventing miniature presses to produce these things. It's an incredibly arduous task. But I think my favorite story from of small books, because it could get a bit repetitive if you went to, you know, kept looking for the record breakers, is... Um, a version is called the Dantino. It's a tiny copy of, of Dante's Divine Comedy. And it was produced by the Salmin brothers of Padua in maybe 1879. Uh, please don't hold me to these dates. Um, uh -huh. And, uh, and the, why this book is famous, and actually the dealer at this fair who sold me this miniature book told me, I had a copy of it as well. Um, I couldn't afford it sadly, but he told the story of how um, it's famous for being a very dangerous book because it completely destroyed the eyesight of the people, of the printers, the designers, the um, the tool makers, of everyone who worked on it, because it, it was it took weeks and weeks to produce um, just a few pages. They had to go incredibly slowly and delicately, and it was so small that it just um, painfully strains the eyesight. I can test testify to that because I tried to read it, and you get an almost instant uh, headache or pain behind the eye. Um, so it's a sort of legendary weaponized typeface in a sense. You must um, tell the story about the smallest published book in the world that was published in Leipzig in 2002. Oh, is that is that this one? This is the one that's called the smallest book in the world. Yes, yes, that's that's this book. Yeah. Is it? Is yeah. that the one? Yes, that's the same one. Yeah. That was, so that was tell, tell us the copy. story about the German dealer you spoke to. And, and the... um, yes, 
uh, who, who was very, <laughs> very nice, but he did mention it when he sold it to me, he, he came with a warning and he said a colleague had had a copy uh, at past tense, um, but she'd made the mistake of um, breathing and had accidentally exhaled and spent the rest of the day on her hands and knees um, examining the floorboards with a magnifying glass, trying to find something that as big as a peppercorn. Yeah. Um, and so he, he said, you know, for goodness sake, just, just it's why it comes in the box. Just keep it in the box. <laughs> don't show it to people. It's not worth it. And hold your breath. And for goodness sake, don't do it anywhere dusty where you might sneeze. That's very good. Um, so uh, just uh, bigging up your footnotes again, there's a fantastic <laughs> footnote in this chapter. Books of spectacular size. Dr. Johnson claimed to have such a good memory that he, re he could recite an entire chapter of Neil Horrobo's 1758 work, The Natural History of Iceland, from memory. And the chapter goes as follows. Chapter 72, concerning snakes, there are no snakes to be met with throughout the entire island. There you go. It's a good party trick to have. I was thinking, yeah, I think I recommend yeah. it to people. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I didn't, do you want? What do you feel like uh, moving on to? Is there anything? Well, I just I think you should t t tell the ladies and gentlemen about some of the biggest books, really, as you've done the tiny ones. Yeah. About the Young um, Encyclopedia. Yeah, the the Google Encyclopedia. Yes. Uh, well, the Yongle Emperor uh, attempted. He, he basically, like you, he wanted to to know everything, um, and to him, uh, unable to buy the uh, Britannica or anything like that, he decided to make his own. But being an emperor. Um, he decided to do it thoroughly. So he sent, he spent a period of decades sending out scribes across China to compile every written work that they could find to produce this work that actually is in part lost because it was just impossible to keep together over the, over the centuries. Um, but it was the first Wikipedia in a sense. He wanted it all yeah. at his fingertips. So he wanted knowledge to come to him. Um, quite, you know, fair enough if you've got the, if you've got the budget for it. Um, but supposedly, if you stacked all of the, the volumes of this encyclopedia together, it would fill a very large, one of those very large uh, truck trailers that lorries pull down the motorway. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's a sort of extraordinary pre-Wikipedia. Um, and on the, on the other end of that, actually thinking about it, um, thanks to the wonders of Google uh, and Google Translate, I struck up a pen pal ship with a Brazilian tax lawyer named Vinicius, <laughs> what's his name, Vinicius Leoncio. Yeah. Um, and being a lawyer, he was absolutely infuriated with um, Brazil's labyrinthine, uh, ridiculously extensive um, tax law, the amount of laws that are constantly generated, new laws are brought in all the time. They have one of the worst systems in the world, the most complicated. And so as an act of protest, he spent something like $200,000 of his own money. Um, uh, many, many years. He went through several heart attacks. Well, and 23 years, you say. 23, 23 years. years. And a, a divorce and a new marriage and various heart attacks to uh, print out every single Brazilian tax law and bind it together in one book. I don't think we've given the image, but I wonder if you can see here. And he very kindly sent me a photo to include in the book. And can you see him there? He's He's perched on top of his magnum office there. It's yeah, something so like this is a book, 41,000 pages long, almost seven feet thick and weighs seven and a half tons. I mean, that is... Seven and a half tons, yeah. That was the weight of the John Lewis bat, a lorry that came earlier today. I mean, that's how big it was. Um, <laughs> and and uh, yeah, and so I was just asking him about why he did it and he sort of explained his protest reasons. And then I, you know, the obvious question to ask is, is he planning a second edition? But he said, no, there are, there are no <laughs> plans to, uh, to add to it. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, so um, we are going to have questions in about five or six minutes so that I should remind anybody who'd like to ask Ed a question, Edward a question, please um, sure. get in touch with the moderator. If there's anyone uh, and there, we'll, yeah. we'll hopefully we can come to you. We've got 15 minutes for that. So my last section here, the last picture I think we haven't dealt with is the triangular book of oh, uh, Count yes. saint -Germain. Oh, yes. Yeah, Should we? that's image 11, I think. Okay. Now, <laughs> so one, one of the um, chapters in there, one of the areas that was a lot of fun to research is cryptic books, to look at books of code 
and cipher and go beyond the ones that always fill the pages of the Daily Mail amid claims that someone has cracked it because they've used a, an Aramaic dictionary or something like that. So I wanted to find works that were much more obscure. So the triangular book of uh, the Count Saint-Germain um, is just as interesting as its author, just as strange as its author. The Count uh, Saint-Germain was um, a legendary figure in uh, high society in Europe. In that book was produced around 1750. Um, so he's coming a bit later than George Salmanazar, but equally charismatic. And he was a, a hit at parties. He was a very strange man. He claimed to be an adventurer. No one could quite place his accents. He he was always he'd always make up a new story whenever anyone asked him about his origins. And he claimed to have discovered the secret to longevity. He was so old, he said, that he'd been at, he had attended the wedding at Cana, where Jesus had turned water to wine. Um, and all the secrets of this um, this uh, magic science that he discovered were contained in this um, uh, frustratingly cryptic work. But it's such a it's such an amazing object. Um, that's in the I think it's in the collection of the Getty Research Institute. Um, but uh, that that is a classic example of basically using a book as an excuse to tell the story of. A, a wonderfully eccentric character because Horace Walpole said of him, uh, wrote of him, uh, uh, he, he sings, he plays the violin wonderfully, composes, is mad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and he, claimed, he, did, he claimed to be so old he'd been to the wedding at Cana yeah, where Jesus yeah, turned exactly, into yeah. wine. Yeah, yeah. So wh who, why, who wouldn't want to talk to someone like that at a party? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Great. So, so the, oh gosh, there's so much, um, Edward, we could uh, talk about. Is there anything you want to mention before I turn to questions? Because we've got some coming in here. I wonder if there's a couple of minutes. There's one image that I think is worth showing because it links on from eccentrics. If you see image seven there. Um, Raffinesque's because, notebook. Raffinesque. So, Raffinesque, the um, French naturalist. Um, this is from 1818. This is a book 17, 17 of his notebooks. And it looks fairly standard for a, for a, a wildlife expert. He traveled to Kentucky in 1818 to meet his hero, uh, John James Audubon, who is most famous for, for producing uh, that double elephant folio, Birds of America, which is one of the most valuable books in the world. Um, beautiful, beautiful um, book. Um, but Raffinesque was absolutely obsessed with um, uh, studying uh, natural history. And all he wanted to talk about was Audubon. He invited himself to stay. He vastly overstayed his welcome. And all he did was want to, uh, to grill Audubon about the local wildlife that he discovered to the point where Audubon was getting incredibly irritated by this tunnel vision <laughs> man. And actually when I was looking for good stories, I was reading Audubon's diary and he mentions uh, they'd all gone to bed uh, and there was a loud crashing noise that came from the guest room. And he burst in to see what the ruckus was. And he discovered Ravinesque had grabbed Audubon's favorite prized violin and was chasing a bat around the room, trying ah. to brain it and capture it as a specimen. Um, so you can imagine that is uh, perhaps the most annoying kind of house guest. So what happened is that Audubon started uh, teasing him, having fun with him. He, was, he, was, he clearly took things very literally. So Audemont started making up details of local wildlife, inventing animals, describing them, and Raffinesque very faithfully, um, completely um, believe, believing every word that his hero said, would jot down these details. And so in that image, we have, um, these, are complete, these are four completely uh, made up fish. And my okay. favorite is at the bottom left, which is the, um, the devil, Devil Jack Diamond fish, which was uh, noted to be bulletproof. Can we see the picture um, and it was, briefly? Oh yeah, uh, picture seven. Um, so that fish at the bottom left, which uh, has quite a lot of character for a fish in the face, um, was supposedly bulletproof. Hunters had tried to kill it, and it was responsible for uh, leaping out of the banks and snatching two men further upstream. And so Raffiness copied all this down. Um, um, copied them into his published um, works of his experiences in America and was absolutely humiliated upon publication when people pointed out there was a load of rubbish. Right, um, well, that is 
an hour. Thank you so much, Edward. That was Gosh, really No, thank marvelous. you, John. Um, so we've got time, say we've got a few minutes for questions. Um, and here's one. What was Edward's favorite find? Which of all the books you found did you get most excited by? That, yeah, that's a really, um, that's a really tough question. Then. I think I'm, I, it's, my answer is always different because it's like when someone asks you, I, I imagine you get asked a lot, tell me, tell me your favorite joke or something like that. You always have yeah, to it's impossible. come up with something. And, and, so, and the most interesting thing you know, it's impossible. Yes, exactly. So I'm going to give grab us a short list. Give us a little yeah, short list. Well, I'll give you the thing, the first one that popped into my head, and this will just, this will really not undo much to uh, for my gravitas. But this is a wonderful book. Uh, let me show it up. It's called Naked Came the Stranger. It was produced in 1969, written by uh, Penelope Ash, and it was in fact uh, a very calculated, unambitious hoax by a group of journalists who wanted to show how um, novels like was it Valley of the Dolls was was a sort of these sort of pulpy trashy sexy novels that were all the rage um, just how trashy they were and how easy they were to write so a group of American journalists in San Francisco I think got together um, and each divided the chapters among themselves and I think they produced it in about a week uh, they published it didn't tell anyone that it was a total joke and it was a story of uh, a bored housewife on Long Island sleeping with everyone that she could. Uh, and it's actually in, in the inside, it's dedicated to daddy, which is rather upsetting. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it sold, I think the reception, it sold something like 400,000 copies. It was a sensation. Uh, the movie rights were, well, they attempted to try and option the movie rights and its authors were completely horrified that no one had picked up on the satire of it. Um, and in fact, it just, it just became a, a best-selling novel that everyone tried to read. Um, so I love the idea that as sophisticated as literary hoaxes are, they can sometimes just go completely over the heads. It means they work too well. And there was a quote, I quoted the author in the book where he, he'd reflected on the whole episode. He'd refused, he'd turned down hundreds of thousands of dollars to do a sequel. And he said, America, sometimes I worry about you. Yeah. A bit like um, springtime for Hitler. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, a question from Alexandra. Hello. Um, this Hello. is about anthropodermic bibliophagy. From which part of the body would the skin be taken? The back? And would they make more than one book out of one body? That's a very good question. I'm, from what I understand and from the examples that we have, the copies were, are unique. From what I'm aware of, there, it wasn't a run. There wasn't a, a series. There wasn't a great demand for um, multiple corpses. And, and I, I've read that some skin was taken from the leg, some from the back. Um, and I think with the Countess, it probably would have been the shoulders and the back. It's wherever it's sort of most flexible. Um, but, it, I, you know, at the same time, it, it's treated like any other leather. And aside from there's one uh, turn of the century uh, book historian I quote who said he'd he'd gone to Paris and viewed in person um, a copy of the 1792 Constitution that had been bound in the skin of a revolutionary supposedly, um, and he said it it feels and looks just like normal leather, but it's actually quite hard to get rid of the hair, so it's quite sort of there's the occasional bumps and little protruding. Uh -huh. hair. Um, but um, no, I, as far as I'm aware, the copies were unique. And um, there's actually another anecdote um, from a, an American book designer who was recalling in 1950, uh, a woman had come to him um, ask, uh, with a letters written to her late husband, asking him to bind these letters in the skin of, of her late husband. And he, he just mentions that he was very concerned because she had remarried and he couldn't help but wonder whether her second husband was worried that he was going to become uh, volume two. And so the binder just writes, the, the binder writes, let us hope it was a strictly limited edition. <laughs> right, so um, here's a question about the pictures in the book. Was it difficult yeah. to get permissions for the images? Because there must be, do you know how many there are? How many hundreds there are? Several hundred. Yes, I think um, a, a heavily illustrated book 
is well my i've done um a book called the phantom atlas which was about places that we believed existed on maps through the centuries yeah and that's about maps and that was maybe 200 i think there are nearly 400 images in here um it's ridiculous but but it it, it works and my publishers designers are absolutely amazing at, at fitting everything in uh, i had to cut half the material out of it as well to sort of condense everything um but in terms of um, image clearances, you know, it was a period of 10 years. It was, it was talking to a lot of dealers um, uh, and just, just asking. You never know if you just ask someone um, what they might say. Yeah. And if you explain the idea and you, you know, you're genuine with your enthusiasm for it and say, you know, it, it would be such an honor to have this image in here. Um, a lot of dealers were perfectly happy to um, give permission. Um, and also I go by a lot of libraries uh, who offer a lot into the public domain. The British Library have been incredibly um, active and, and generous in, I think they've uploaded something like a million pictures into the public domain. So purely to get a book like this published, you have to use every sort of, uh, every trick in the book to legally find ways of, um, of just sort of called begging favours really, um, and looking did, for alternatives did anyone and photographing a lot of the books. Did anyone refuse permission? I think there was one map dealer who who did, and it was only because he'd just given permission to someone else to use it in a book, which was fair enough. Um, and then at a rare book fair, I happened to see that same book and asked if I could kindly take a picture for my book, and they were they were very willing. So, um, and also I had to I had to pay to clear a lot of them as well, but but that, that's not a oh yeah story. that's so there wasn't for nothing it's not all free oh god that would be wonderful no no i think um some works are just so unique um which is why i'm very nervous uh, about uh, this book i'm about to start which is uh, the same idea but applying it to the history of art and it'll be called the madman's gallery mm. and looking for strange because the problem with paintings unlike books you know they're not um really reprinted a lot um so that should be interesting um but yeah i think any if anyone's interested in getting into writing non-fiction um learning some good public domain archives to explore is a is an absolute um must and you can find gold mines of ideas in that so one question i i had edward was um did you why were there no pictures of kit williams masquerade in the book that struck me as really odd because oh, you can't really grasp is. what it is until you see it yes there where are we we are that was where is Kit Williams? I think that was there not a picture of Kit Williams in there? So, of him, masquerade. Yes, but not of the book. Oh, I thought they were maybe holding it up. I couldn't remember. Oh um, no, but I, I don't know. But I I wrote well, a parody of that. Oh, <laughs> right. This is quite a From this is from the first Spitting Image book. Oh and wow! It's a parody version yeah, of Masquerade, it. and it's yeah. the President's brain is missing. So we made a <laughs> right, okay. Reagan's gold brain and and uh offered oh, right. a thousand pounds first person to find it yeah yeah well do you remember the 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 excitement of of that book at the time i mean how because i oh, i don't it, remember it. i mean yeah beautiful paintings yeah. Uh, absolutely delicious and it seemed like it really captured the sort of a, obsession of the nation at the time it must have paid oh, a lot of press yeah it's an amazing story <laughs> Yes, if you're going to bring out a book, um, that's a that's a great publicity trick to bury a golden hair somewhere and say that there are clues inside the book to find it. Yeah, and then unleash the great British public on on uh, <laughs> on the countryside with shovels. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I don't know if anyone's got any more questions because we've got uh, about five minutes uh, left to run. Um, Mm. Otherwise, well, while we're waiting, Ed, we're just going to do a little bit of. Uh, so, where can they buy the book? Do they? Do we know? Oh, I think there's a link. There's a link, isn't there? there. Um, so, as I say, it's been so delightful talking to you. I, um, I really, well, thank you, John. Thoroughly enjoyed the book, and I read a lot of books, and I don't. Yeah. There's very few books I like as much as this one. I honestly oh, say. Oh, well, that's very that's kind of you. Well Thank you. And a great present for somebody too. But what we thought yeah. we'd do to to finish off was um, the last chapter in the book is called "Strange Titles," which is the books that you know all sound <laughs> very intriguing, but you haven't got room to do everything, so you've just got mm. the titles. So 
let's yeah. look, let's look through those and see which ones you would like to have in your collection. Yeah, I I am fascinated by the amount of literature that was obsessed with defending baldness and descent, defending beards that was produced. If you look at the very earliest one, it's called Eclogia de Calvis, or In Praise of Bald Men, because yeah. obviously this is from nine nine ten, and obviously at that time the writers were uh, monks. Um, and so a lot of the more whimsical literature um, produced at that time is, is books like that. I think the British Library has the very first book called um, Apologia Bar de Barbis, or In Defense of Beards as well, um, which was written by a bishop who, who produced it to calm um, the warring factions of his monasteries, those who had beards and those who didn't, um, to say that they were equally as respectable and uh, as worthy to God. Um, but is there a title that you were curious about, John? Well, there's some there's some absolute crackers in here. Um... Well, Jonathan Swift had a real knack with uh, titles. Um, so, for example, 1722, um, he disguised himself under the pseudonym the Countess of Fizzle Rumpf and wrote Ars Musica, or the Ladies' Back Report, <laughs> which is a, hist a, a book about farting, basically. Uh. I quite like Nuclear War, What's in It for You, from 1982. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, a lot of these, I, they're in the collection of the British Library, if anyone wants to find them. I went there to sort of are they? see them in do person, they have, yes. Do they have Proceedings of the Second International Workshop on Nude Mice, Japanese? <laughs> I wonder. I wonder, quite possibly. That's a good uh, research challenge. They definitely have Does the Earth Rotate? No, from 1919 by William Westfield. <laughs> In person, that was wonderful. Collectible um, spoons of the Third Reich. Mm. <laughs> yes, that's about that. Actually, I think that was featured on some one of the American talk shows, and that actually has got a bit of a cult following. That book has it. Yeah. An Irishman's difficulties with the Dutch language of 1912. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's who in cocker spaniels? <laughs> um, what would Christ do about syphilis? Pigs. How to make them pay? I missed that one. <laughs> well, um, that's amazing. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Sir Say Edward. It's been it's been great fun. I hope everybody has has, has enjoyed it at home. Um, and I think uh, I'll hand over to the boss now. Thank you so much to Edward and John for that absolutely fascinating conversation. If you want to find out more about the British Library's events programme, please consult our website. We'd also encourage you to fill in our feedback form. And don't forget, of course, that you can find a link to buy Edward's book, The Manman's Library, there. Thank you ever so much for joining us and goodbye.